Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a wrap-up of some of the recent nonfiction that I've read. First up, I read a collection of essays by Josip Novakovic called Shopping for a Better Country. This is an interesting collection in that the essays were written over a series of more than a decade, but in this publication his current self sometimes comments on things that are happening within the essays that were current at the time, but then he's looking back at it retrospectively and parenthetically within the essays, which is really interesting. As with any kind of collection like this, not all of them were necessarily as interesting as I would have wanted, but as a whole collection I did think it was really fascinating. In the title essay, Novakovic is originally from Croatia. He moved to the United States when he was in his 20s, which is when it was still part of Yugoslavia. He then later moved to Canada in his 50s. He's currently a lecturer at Concordia University. And in the title essay he's talking about making this move from the United States to Canada, but also reflecting on how his own position as a Croatian in the United States has evolved over time, both because during the Cold War there was one set of ideas, during the wars in the 90s there was a different set of ideas, then later on the, the attitudes shift slightly, but at the same time his sister who moved to Germany around the same time that he moved to the United States and deals with a different and more negative set of expectations just because being perceived under the guest worker umbrella is different from being perceived as kind of generically another European, which is what he gets in an American context. So I thought that was all really interesting. Uh, and it was also fun to see him pondering that and then have the parenthetical bits from the current day where he has already moved to Canada and is thinking about it and has additional information that he wouldn't have had when he originally wrote the essay. There's another fantastic essay in here that's surrounding re-exporting a cello. He was working on a writing project in Russia at one point while his son, who is a musician, was still a student and his son had brought this cello with him from the United States. And as they leave Russia he didn't have the correct paperwork to bring the cello with him and there's a lot of drama from that. And it's just kind of fascinating because it's commentary on everything from international paperwork to just... it's a really solid piece. The bits of this that were very good were excellent. There are some that were things that I didn't particularly care about, but overwhelmingly I quite enjoyed reading this. Next up I read Billy Ray Belcourt's memoir A History of My Brief Body. This was an interesting read because his poetry collections have struck me as being very kind of compelling but still accessible. Like he does interesting structural things with found poetry, with erasure poetry, but still in a way that doesn't make you feel like you need to be somebody with a PhD in literature to understand. This on the other hand opens with a quote from Maggie Nelson, which I'm not a big fan of Maggie Nelson, I thought The Argonauts was insufferably pretentious, and this is written in a very similar style. Some of the references are slightly more mainstream than Maggie Nelson's are often are, but it is really of that type. Now at a certain point in this he does essentially explain why that is. There was a review in Walrus magazine of his first poetry collection which was very patronizing about simplicity, and I think calling accessible poetry simple is misrepresenting just how much skill is involved in making accessible poetry, so I think that the fact that Walrus eventually changed some of the wording in that was warranted because, yes, patronizing, but at the same time because, because that is referenced then you understand why this is so complicated in ways that I would prefer something not to be. Now if you are a big fan of Maggie Nelson's writing in general or the Argonauts specifically, I think you will also enjoy this. This is obviously a different kind of memoir. Her memoir was obviously dealing more with changing bodies and through a different kind of context. This is a very kind of Edmonton and Northern Alberta indigenous queer context in a more masculine way I guess, whereas that's dealing more with in more complicated gender in an American white sense, but stylistically very similar. So if you liked that I think you will like this. If you found the Argonauts to be insufferably pretentious, this isn't quite as insufferable in how intentionally complicated it is but it definitely recalls that. So this was interesting because as I said from his poetry I didn't expect this huge stylistic change and as I said the the style that he's going for and the references that he makes to Maggie Nelson's writing. It wasn't a connection that I'm a fan of but I know a lot of people really are so 
you may enjoy this significantly more than I did. And also if you are from Edmonton or Northern Alberta, I think you will also get a lot more out of this because there are references in there. Because there are a lot of local flavor bits in that. Next up, I read another memoir, and this is Rebecca Tausig's Sitting Pretty. The View from My Ordinary, Resilient, Disabled Body. This is one of a few memoirs that I've seen lately that is from people who have a big presence on Instagram, writing about essentially the experience of growing up in a disabled body in the United States after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I would say this is very similar in a lot of ways to like Kia Brown's The Pretty One. As with that, there are a lot of assumptions in here that you are coming from a very similar cultural space. I was actually slightly more irritated with the assumptions of that in this than I was in The Pretty One, although I think this has some additional really interesting stuff that makes it still worthwhile. The author is a high school teacher and she created a class for high school in which she was introducing her students to the social model of disability and she kind of goes through a process of trying to work out how she can explain that to the students in a way that would both break through their own kind of ableist beliefs, to, but also to explain this theory that a lot of people don't discover until they're a little older, which is unfortunate. So I thought those two chapters that dealt specifically with how she was doing the course make this 100% worthwhile. As I said with The Pretty One, I think if you have a lot in common with her outside of the disability element, and you haven't read a lot of disability memoirs before, I do recommend this because I think it that makes it relatable in a very specific way. But reading it, I kind of resented some of the assumptions she was making about how much her audience was going to relate to her attitudes towards things like. There's one point where she's trying to explain the, the challenge of finding accessible housing, which is a major issue, but her illustration of that is like, is the oh no, then I had to move back in with my parents at the age of 29. Now, and if you, like much of the world, don't have a problem with multi-generational living, that doesn't seem like the best illustration of why lack of accessible housing is such an issue. I think if you are specifically a kind of Anglo-American of her similar background, then maybe that matters to you. But as somebody who's kind of outside of that, I just thought, this you're describing a real problem in a way that makes it less universal than it really is. So. I didn't love that, but as I said, the classroom stuff in this is very good. So your mileage may vary, and it is a very short and quick read. So there we go. Next up, I listened to an audiobook, which is kind of essays and kind of poetry, and that was Claudia Rankin's Citizen and American Lyric. My notes about who did the, who recorded the audio are on my phone, but I'll note that in the description. This is really interesting because it digs into a lot of American cultural issues with a kind of unusual specificity. I think there are a lot of books that people have been recommending lately that talk about major social impacts that a lot of uh, racial stereotyping and a lot of kind of structural oppression ha has on the lives of everyday people. But in this, there are quite a few bits that are really much more narrow and much more specific. And a few of them are very sports related, which I thought was really interesting. There's a really long section about the Williams sisters in tennis that I thought was really fantastic. I do enjoy tennis, so if you don't like tennis, I don't know if it's that will be as fascinating as it was for me, but I really appreciated that bit. And she does step outside of the American context as well. There's one that is about the French national football team that I was surprised, because I don't hear a lot of Americans talking about that as much. It talks about, you know, the famous headbutt and everything. I didn't love the voice that the narrator does for Zinedine Zidane, I thought, that he doesn't sound like what she was when she has a quote from him I'm like that's not what he sounds like but I, I think that's the only real complaint I have about the narration itself was that I was like no he does not sound like that but in any case I appreciated that this is a topic that we've seen a lot of writing about but I haven't necessarily seen it from this kind of sports focus it does get into personal stories as well which all of which is very well done and has that balance of memoir, social commentary, and almost poetry. But that is something that was less unique than I think some of the sports stuff was. Yeah, that was well worth it and quite short. The audiobook was under two hours, I think. So, yeah. All right, that's it. if you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought. Um, yeah, that's it for now. Ciao.